Hi, I'm, I'm Vince Witkowski, and I chair the Society's International and National Security Law Practice Group. Uh, first of all, I'd like to invite anyone here who's inter interested in the work of the group to uh, reach out to me, either at one of the receptions or on the sidelines or by email. Uh, uh, please, uh, we welcome the active participation of our, of our members. I'm uh, also delighted to present a really distinguished panel, a truly distinguished panel on the subject of interest to us all, whether we want it to be or not. Uh, convening a transatlantic panel like this requires resources, and I'd like to thank our, our co-sponsor, the uh, National Security Institute at, at George Mason, for uh, co-sponsoring. And I'm pleased to introduce the, uh, the uh, director of that institution and the moderator of this panel, uh, Jamil Jaffer. Now, I'm sure I'm going to forget something in, a, in a, uh, my brief review, but uh, Jamil, in uh, the George W. Bush administration, served in the uh, Justice Department and, and, and as an associate White House counsel. Uh, he spent a little time in private practice and found out, confirmed he had an incurable case of Potomac fever, so he uh, re returned to government uh, and the, uh, uh, and the as counsel to the House Intelligence Committee and then as senior advisor general counsel to the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He has experience in the judicial branch, having served uh, clerk for Edith uh, uh, Jones and for Justice Gorsuch twice, once at the uh, Tenth Circuit years ago and then uh, last spring as a, as a pinch hitter. Um, he is uh, an adjunct professor at George Mason and the director of its law and national uh, uh, security policy program. Uh, he has affiliations with Hoover and Stanford. Uh, he's the senior vice president of product development for IronNet, which is a, a cybersecurity company founded by uh, former NSA uh, chief Keith Alexander. Uh, and he still manages to get about two hours sleep a night. So with that, Jamil. Thank you so much, Ben. I, I suppose I should stand. I see Professor Epstein gesturing at me. Um, so, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, we're very excited to have a distinguished panel here. You know, it's one of these things where when you're on a panel and you're thinking about, well, who's the Where's Waldo in this room? And you realize it's you. So uh, we've, got, uh, we've got Ambassador Nathan Sales just confirmed to be the coordinator for counterterrorism at the U.S. State Department uh, just 13 weeks ago. Um, the, uh, what's that? Time flies. Time flies. Um, uh, Professor Sales uh, is also, before he came, Ambassador Sales, before he came to, uh, to the State Department, was Professor Sales teaching at both Syracuse University Law School and prior to that at George Mason University Law School. Uh, he served in a variety of jobs in the federal government, including as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy at the Department of Homeland Security, in the Office of Legal Policy at the Justice Department, where he oversaw the confirmation of Chief Justice John Robertson, where I actually worked for him. Um, and he's also a graduate of the Miami of Ohio University, summa cum laude, a JD from Duke Law School, and most importantly, clerk for Judge David Sentel of the DC Circuit. So, Professor Sales, Ambassador Sales. I'll also introduce our other panelists. Uh, we have Robert Hannigan, uh, the former director of the, gov of the UK's GCHQ, their surveillance agency, from 2014 to 2017, um, where he was instrumental in, in getting past the United Kingdom's Intelligence Powers Act of 2016. He's also a leader on cyber uh, security issues, having created the first national cybersecurity strategy in the entire Western world. He's also an advisor to the Prime Minister at Number 10 Downing Street from 2007 to 2010, served as the head of the Cabinet Office uh, for Intelligence, um, which oversaw MI5, GCHQ, and the SIS. Um, and he's known for his strong views on a variety of issues, having, on his first week on the job, being both critical of Silicon Valley as well as defending the concepts of strong encryption. So, Mr. Hannigan. We also have with us Dr. August Hanning. Dr. Hanning served as the State Secretary for the Federal Interior Ministry in Germany from 05 to 09. He was the head of the BND in Germany, uh, for seven years from 1998 to 2005. He studied law at Münster and Freiburg and was the head of the division of the permanent mission of Western, West Germany to East Germany, which is to say he was the chief diplomat between East and West Germany for a huge time. Dr. Hannig. 
And last, but certainly not least, one of my favorite people in the entire world, Judge Michael Mukasey. Judge Mukasey served from 2007 to 2009 as the Attorney General of the United States. From 1998 to 2006, as a, as a judge, on the, a district judge on the Southern District of New York, and as the chief judge starting in the year 2000. Prior to that, Judge Mukasey served in a variety of positions, including as an assistant United States attorney in the Southern District of New York. He has a law degree from Yale and a bachelor degree from Columbia. Judge Mukasey. So with that, I'm going to sit down for the rest of the panel. I'd love to turn to Ambassador Sales first and ask you, you know, there's been a lot of debates post Edward Snowden about data privacy between the United States and, and, and Europe. What, are, what is at the heart of these debates over privacy? What are some of the issues that you see in your role uh, as ambassador at large for counterterrorism? I know there are a range of issues. We'd love to hear about something from you. Well, thanks, Jamil, for the question. Um, and thanks to my co-panelists. It's a pleasure to share the stage with you. Thank you all for being here. Um, I suspect that much of this conversation is going to concern uh, Section 702. Those of you who don't know what that means will figure it out very shortly. Um, but I want to tell you about the most important surveillance program you've never heard of. Um, before I do that, though, uh, let me tell you a story. Um, so in 2003, a, a Jordanian man named Raid Albana was flying on a flight from Europe uh, to Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. Uh, all of his paperwork was in order. He had a valid passport. He had a visa uh, that had been issued in due course to enter the United States. He'd actually been to the United States several times before. There had never been any incidents uh, with his travel to the U.S. Um, but the computer system that Customs and Border Protection uses to process uh, people who are flying to the United States and screen people flying to the United States alerted that this is somebody who should get a little extra scrutiny. Um, and so, sure enough, when he approached the passport uh, at Customs Station, uh, he presented his travel documents and um, was pulled aside for extra scrutiny. His, he seemed a little evasive to the border officials who were scrutinizing him. Um, it seemed like he was trying to de deceive them about his purpose for visiting the United States. And so the customs officers turned him around, put him on a plane home. Um, they took his fingerprints first. That was the last anybody heard of Reid Albana um, for about 18 months. We heard from him again in Hilla, Iraq, when a massive truck bomb detonated outside a police recruiting station, killing dozens of uh, police recruits. It was the deadliest suicide bombing that Iraq had seen up to that point, and that's saying something. The driver was Reid Albana, and we know that because his hand was still attached to the steering wheel. Now, nobody knows what he was going to do in the United States when he tried to get in 18 months earlier. I, for one, am glad that we didn't have to find out. Um, so how did we know to give him a closer look? Well, the answer is PNR, the passenger name record data. This is information uh, that you provide to airlines when you book a ticket. And the airline records things such as your seat preference, the credit card number you use to book the reservation, your frequent flyer number. Um, whether you've requested the, uh, the special meal, I recommend it. It's usually better than what the slop they serve you in coach. Uh, so the information collected by airlines is then turned over to um, government officials who use it for a number of purposes. The most basic application of it is watch list, mas watch list matching. Uh, is Jeff Smith, who's on the watch list, the same Jeff Smith who's trying to enter the country. Well, the richer the data set you have, the easier it is to resolve the false positives and the false negatives. Oh, we're looking for Jeff Smith who was born on October 1st, not the Jeff Smith who was born on November 3rd, right? The more sophisticated uses of the data are possible as well. Um, you can do link analysis, for instance. Um, has anybody booked a airline ticket with the same frequent flyer number associated with it as, say, Mohammed Atta? Well, not him, obviously, now. Um, but um, it's possible to use these hidden connections, to find these hidden connections between known threats and unknown threats to develop a much more comprehensive picture of uh, the threat environment and to identify uh, the unknown threats. Um, what does this have to do with Europe and transatlantic cooperation? Well, quite a lot, actually. Um, the United States has been a pioneer in using PNR data uh, to screen inbound travelers, um, and I think it has done so 
in the past, notwithstanding some very serious reservations uh, by certain entities in Europe. Member states have been largely supportive of this effort, um, and have, many of them have developed their own systems uh, to replicate the same capabilities that the United States has, but other elements um, have been rather less supportive. Um, why does it matter now? Well, the reason it matters now is because the agreement between the United States and the European Union that amounts to a blessing or ratification of this U.S. law and policy and practice um, is coming under strain. Uh, the European Court of Justice last summer invalidated a proposed agreement between the European Union and uh, Canada uh, holding that it failed to comply with basic European privacy safeguards uh, and thus could not enter into force in its current form. The court decided that all sorts of different measures should be uh, adopted before it could go into force, such as, well, things that are essentially unworkable. Um, before you share the data from the intelligence analyst who's looking at it to the intelligence analyst who needs to see it, you have to go to a court and say, mother, may I? Uh, not exactly a recipe for bureaucratic efficiency. Um, although the ECJ's decision only imperils the Canadian agreement, um, there are concerns that we're next and that uh, after the Canadian agreement gets uh, invalidated and rewritten, um, elements that are not terribly sympathetic to the use of PNR will uh, put the U.S. agreement in their crosshairs as well. I can tell you that's a non-starter. The position of the United States is we are not prepared to accept any additional restrictions on our ability to access, analyze, or share PNR data. Um, we've communicated that position at the highest possible levels, um, and I don't imagine that the United States um, is going to back off of our decades-long commitment to this platform. Instead, what I think we're going to do is work with European member states to help them develop their own PNR systems. Uh, last year, and I've, I've gone far over my three minutes I see now, so I'll end here. Um, you, uh, the, the, the Council of Europe or some other uh, European institution, uh, the proliferation of which continues to baffle me, uh, directed the uh, member states of Europe to develop their own PNR systems by March of 2018. Um, this is a great step forward for transatlantic cooperation, transatlantic data sharing, um, and cooperation on CT in particular. So we look forward very much uh, to seeing those systems come online by March of 2018, and we stand ready to assist however we can. And with that, I look forward to hearing the rest of the panel. Well, thank you, Ambassador Sale. Appreciate it. So, Director Hagen, you know, we um, in the U.S. have these surveillance laws that are being reauthorized every so often. We're in the midst of a debate today, uh, just now going on on Capitol Hill, about reauthorizing, as, as uh, Ambassador Sales mentions, the surveillance program of foreigners located overseas called the 702 program. Uh, you were instrumental in passing a U.K. surveillance law uh, in 2016 that, it, that went beyond surveillance, but expanded the powers of the British government. Um, and in this time of sort of expanded counterterrorism threats, where we're seeing threats uh, both in Europe and the United States, largely fomented from the Middle East. Um, how do you see that tension resolving itself in Europe, uh, where you're able to pass these laws in, in the UK? There are challenges, of course, in Germany. There are challenges in the United States. Ambassador Sales has talked about some of the challenges with the ECJ and their review of the sharing of data amongst the United States and, and, and Europe and collection within Europe. How do you resolve those issues, and how do you see the law in the UK, and how are you guys able to get that law through? Because we're having that same fight here right now. Oh, well, well, thank you, Jamil, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Great to be here. Uh, well, I know we're going to come back to 702 and actually to PNR, where we're in an unusual position. We're leaving the European Union. So the moment we're in, in one camp, we're going to have to go through a process of negotiating an agreement a bit like the, the one that the United States and Canada has. That's going to be very complex and difficult. Um, but I'll come back to that maybe. I mean, on, to answer your question, I, I think it's worth remembering the context for our legislation. And we have been through a traumatic few years on the, the debate of privacy and surveillance uh, and security. Um, the context was post Snowden, uh, all that you've had here uh, reflected in Europe in a slightly different way. A lot of litigation against government, a lot of people trying to suggest that we've been doing something unlawful, failing actually, um, but in, in the two cases where the government lost um, on, the, on the historic regime that we've been operating, it was not about what we were doing, so the courts never asked us to change anything, it was about uh, transparency or foreseeability in, in, in European terms. So we hadn't said enough about what we were doing. 
And I think that, that political debate, um, combined with what was then a, a new spike in terrorism from ISIL, uh, forced the then government to think, we've, we've got to start again. We've got to, to um, bring together this kind of smorgasbord of surveillance legislation that we had at the time, dating back to, well, the most recent was 2000, but uh, many statutes going back uh, 20, 30 years. Massively confusing, uh, very difficult, even for lawyers to understand, frankly, and I'm not a lawyer. But uh, yeah, it was almost designed to be uh, untransparent. So they commissioned a, a very uh, eminent QC, uh, David Anderson, who'd been the ter terrorism um, reviewer, to, to do a report. He did an excellent report. And he had the confidence across the political spectrum, which is really important. Um, came up with a report in a year. That was turned into a bill uh, with consent from most parties uh, and became an act in 2016. And I think the, that makes it sound easy. I think the, uh, the terrorism threat helped, of course, to focus the mind, made it less academic. Uh, but uh, we had to do a big education uh, project and to get people to understand the new context for terrorism, the, the, how, how the internet changes things. Uh, and I think that wasn't straightforward. I think uh, we were asking for some pretty uh, radical new powers, um, both law enforcement and, and uh, agencies. And, and I, I think just to summarize what, what the Act does, now it is an Act, uh, it relicensed uh, law enforcement and the agencies to do surveillance that is targeted, but also based on bulk data. And of course, bulk was the controversial bit. That was the bit where most of the public heat was. Uh, it did some new things to update. For the first time, it put in explicit statute the power to hack for uh, computer network exploitation, or uh, as the bill calls it, equipment interference. Um, that, was, that was very transparent and out there, and partly as a result of uh, the litigation. We wanted to be completely clear about what we were doing, including in bulk. That was controversial. Um, forcing companies, certainly UK companies, to keep uh, internet connection records, so for a year, um, of, of a browsing history, essentially, although only the, the first click, you know, what websites visited as a, a law enforcement tool, not for intelligence, actually. Uh, that was very controversial. So we've ended up with something which some people don't like, uh, but got cross-party support and uh, is transparent. I mean, I think even its greatest critics will say, well, it, it does actually say what we do and what power the agencies have and how they're overseen. Brings me to the final point on the bill. Um, as a way of balancing this, it inserted the judiciary into the approvals process in a completely new way. Uh, prior to that, judges had been involved after the event. Um, here they are now uh, having to approve uh, operations before they are um, signed off by a minister. So there were, there were checks and balances. Some of it's still being litigated, uh, so there are the usual legal challenges, but so far, so good. Some of them will end up in the European courts, and again, we're not quite sure where that, that leaves us. But I would just make one final point, if it's okay. Uh, I think the one thing that hit us very strongly and hit our legislators very strongly was that w whereas legislation 20, 30 years ago uh, felt like we were legislating for things we could actually do within our own jurisdiction, it very quickly becomes obvious to politicians that most of the levers are in the hands of tech companies based in a different jurisdiction, i.e. the United States. So that does change the equation. And the truth is, we might talk about encryption later, the truth is that this legislation that we passed um, is fine as far as it goes. And if it is allied with uh, a bilateral treaty, which we are in the process of uh, discussing with uh, uh, the administration, and it's been under discussion for some time, uh, it will allow US companies to cooperate. It won't compel them, but it will allow them to remove the conflict of laws that has existed over the Wiretap Act. Um, but it does, I think, it does uh, underline the fact that the world has changed. Um, tech companies are uh, arguably super jurisdictional, but they're certainly not in the jurisdictions of individual states outside the United States. And that fundamentally changes the political and, and legal approach to terrorism, I think. Thank you. Well, it is really pretty amazing uh, what you know what you guys were able to achieve there. I think even Ambassador Sales, who was instrumental in passing in, in writing and passing the Patriot Act, I think would be jealous of the uh, of the of the capabilities you were able to achieve, including well data retention. What's that? Well played. Yeah. Well, you know, Dr. Henning, um, I think it would be really interesting uh, if you could help us understand sort of how Germany sees these issues. You know, uh, after the Snowden um, uh, revelations, uh, some might say, um, well, traitor trade risk activities, um, we, uh, there was a huge debate between the United States and Germany. And you know, a lot, I think, in the US government were surprised 
uh, given uh, the close cooperation that the BND and the United States have had historically, particularly uh, with respect to sharing of terrorism information and, and protecting against terrorist acts in Europe. Um, how, what is the situation as you see it in Germany with respect to the laws? Uh, how do you all undertake your surveillance? How does it compare to what we do in the United States? And, and, and why is there such a, uh, what feels like a difference in the body politic in Germany and publicly, and then the close cooperation that we enjoy behind the scenes between the United States and the BND? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, there are very different reasons. One basic reason is that the attitude in the United States towards intelligence is quite different from the attitude in, the, in Germany. Uh, for the United States, uh, information superiority is a very high goal. I think we have a different view in Germany to a certain extent. And the other point was, of course, that uh, Mr. Snowden has showed uh, us, shown to us that uh, even among friends, uh, spying is not unusual. That was a surprise for many German politicians, especially for our chancellor. And uh, she made this wonderful sentence, uh, spying among friends is not acceptable. But uh, everybody who was in the scene was not so surprised. And uh, therefore, again, uh, there are very mixed feelings. In substance, and that's your question, I think we have still a very close cooperation between BND and uh, our American friends because we are forced to do uh, on behalf of terrorism. And uh, NSA is very helpful. And uh, due to our close relationship with NSA, we have been able to prevent the German population from uh, terrorist attacks several times last year. Therefore, there are these mixed feelings. On the one side, yes, we fear a little bit the strong capacities of the NSA. On the other side, we use the capacities. Therefore, again, mixed feelings. Uh, coming back to the whole field of terrorism, PNR has already been mentioned. You have uh, to bear in mind that we have not suffered 9-11 like you have suffered here in the United States. Therefore, we have sometimes a little bit different feeling, different attitude. On the other side, you see, we have now in Europe, since the beginning of 2016, more than 30 terrorist attacks in Europe. We have in Germany, we have seven uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, we have in Germany now a fast growing number, more than 10,000 so-called Salafists, extreme Muslims. And we have uh, nearly 2,000 people where we think, we assume, that they could carry out terrorist attacks. So-called, we call them in German, Gefährder, dangerous persons. And we have, of course, low capacity. We can't really observe all these people. And therefore, again, we have to use technical means. And we have one big problem, and this big, big problem is the uh, internet. The internet is uh, a platform. It's a globalized mob, on the, uh, on the, to a certain extent. And we see that internet is used as a tool for recruitment, for instruction, for producing terror, uh, explosive devices. And we have uh, got in Germany in the time between 2015 and 2016, nobody knows the exact figures, but 1.4 million people coming from the Middle East, coming from Maghreb, coming from Central Asia, without any real identity control. 80% of these refugees coming to Germany, they came without any identity paper. And we have still 100,000 of people in Germany where we don't know the identity. And we see that they are using the platform, they are using WhatsApp, they are using the modern forms of technique, and therefore for us, again, it's very important to have more control of these platforms. And uh, the other point is uh, that we see that uh, internet is used, uh, of course, for a lot of purposes uh, which uh, are very useful and important for us, but on the other side, we see a lot of uh, hate messages, we see uh, a lot of, uh, um, yes, recruitments, uh, we see these messages coming from ISIS to Germany, and therefore we think we have to get more control on behalf of uh, internet. That is an issue in Germany. I know here in the United States you have uh, the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, we have, of course, our constitution as well. But now we have uh, uh, undertaken a very important step. We have now a new legislation forcing the providers of uh, social networks to be more cautious, uh, to remove hate messages 
uh, to give regularly reports to the government. I think that's a very important step, but it's very new. I don't know whether it will give really work or not, but nevertheless, I think it's a very important step for us. Again, internet is for us one of the main threats against our internal security. So, Judge, uh, you know, as, as uh, you know, uh, Director Hannigan and, and Dr. Hanning have told us, um, you know, there's an increasing sense in Europe that the terrorist threat is growing. We've seen these 30 terrorist attacks, um, all these vehicle attacks uh, in Europe. Uh, we haven't seen as great an uptick in the United States, but we are now seeking to reauthorize a law that, that you were directly involved with uh, getting through Congress uh, when you were the Attorney General, the Section 702 of the, of the Surveillance of the FISA Surveillance Act. Um, what can we learn from the Europeans in terms of the threats that they're under and the potential threats we may face? And what does that say about the way we ought to be thinking about these problems going forward over the next weeks, months, and years? Well, um, I hope what we learn is, in, is not um, that that's coming, is not that that's coming here. Um, because um, there, are other, there are other reasons in Europe for, uh, for this, including open borders. Um, and including um, kind of a cultural decline uh, in Europe, a, a lack of kind of lack of will to maintain um, to maintain standards that I don't think we have here. At least we don't have here yet. Um, the um, I think it's important to understanding the debate uh, about 702 to understand what it is. Um, it is probably the most um, productive um, foreign intelligence tool, uh, certainly signals intelligence that we have. Basically, what it says is that under the guidance of a court, um, the government can conduct, um, uh, for foreign intelligence purposes, um, surveillance of specific telephone numbers, of specific email addresses, um, only uh, with, with, the, with the basis laid out, um, and that the searches have to be designed to uh, obtain uh, foreign intelligence information. Um, and that we can share that with foreign partners only with with uh, uh, surveil only with, with with proper intelligence authorities, um, and that the information itself can be stored for a limit of either two years or five years, depending on depending on the source. Um, this information has been enormously productive. Um, I think the um, what was called the Snowden revelations, in fact, should probably have been called the Snowden distortions, because in Europe, um, Edward Snowden's revelations were met with. The suggestion that the United States, and, and in fact here, we met with the suggestion the United States could conduct uh, surveillance overseas of anybody, anytime, um, with no standards whatsoever. Um, of course, the U.S. Constitution is not a treaty with the world, so I suppose there may be people who think that that's that that's okay. Uh, but in fact, that was not the case. Um, in fact, the um, the foreign s intelligence gathering activities in the United States are overseen by what might regarded by what might be regarded as a Madisonian trifecta. Um, we have the, uh, the oversight, of course, by the executive itself, uh, including the intelligence agencies. Uh, we have oversight by Congress, uh, congressional hearings on uh, the, the activities of the intelligence agencies in pursuing this, this and, of course, uh, the oversight by, by federal judges. Um, you can't do much more than that. Um, and I, I, uh, the, the, the misconceptions about uh, what we gather under 702 and how it works I think are largely responsible for, um, for, the, for, the, for the bad aroma in which it's held. Um, as you pointed out, we are starting, we are going to reauthorize 702, and somebody might scratch his head and say, well, wait a second, why is 702 expiring? Um, it's a good question. Um, last I heard um, the various declarations by the late Osama bin Laden um, and by his successors um, have no sunset provisions in them, um, and yet, um, 702, of course, has a sunset provision. Now, I understand that sunset provisions are useful in some kinds of legislation. For example, legislation that authorizes uh, the use of armed force. You want to make sure that um, the Congress that authorizes that um, is not succeeded by a Congress that has absolutely no stake whatsoever in it and simply washes its hands of it. So you want to get people to have to buy in to certain kinds of activity. But there was a real question, I think, as to whether Congress should have to buy in periodically to um, what's necessary to protect the national security of this country um, when there has been no showing, uh, repeat, no showing of any abuse um, under any of these programs, particularly under 702. 
Thanks, Judge. So, uh, so Ambassador Sales, you know, you mentioned earlier that the ECJ has got these decisions coming up about PNR, um, but the U.S. is not going to accept any restrictions on uh, on our our ability to use PNR data. What happens if the ECJ decides against uh, us, or if they there's a policy decision within uh, one or more of the governments? What 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 are what are we prepared to do? Uh, to address that concern, or or how do we how do we deal with that from a from a sort of you know State Department you know working with our allies perspective? So uh, this conversation has a sort of Groundhog Day quality um, because we dealt with the exact same problems and raised the exact same questions uh, a decade ago. The last time I was in government, um, then at nothing Homeland changes. Security. Nothing changes, right? Plus, all change, right? Um, what we said then was. Um, sanction your airlines. Lufthansa is under an obligation to, under U.S. law, uh, and under international law as well, uh, Chicago Convention from 1948 uh, obliges all airlines flying to a destination country to comply with the domestic law of that country. U.S. law requires Lufthansa to turn over the data. If Germany has a problem with that, they can sanction Lufthansa. We don't think you're going to do it. Will we um, turn around to the thousand air, air, uh, plane in the air and say, go back? We would find the airlines for not complying with U.S. law. That's what we said that we would do in um, the 2007-2006 era. Um, I don't think it has to come to that. Um, I think that looking forward now, not just as a historical uh, footnote, but looking forward as to what the future could hold, I don't think it needs to come to that because I think today um, there is a much wider appreciation for how effective PNR data can be um, and how useful it is in addressing a threat that is on the rise in Europe and elsewhere around the world um, in countries that have the resources and capabilities uh, to develop systems like this of their own. And I know you have to leave us at 1 o'clock to go to an important meeting, so I just, I just hope that the panelists can maybe talk a little bit about yeah. PNR. Who wants, to, who wants to beat me up before I go? <laughs> so, so, you know, the, I, I think, uh, you know, Ambassador Sales has said the U.S. is going to put its foot down. It, it's going to start fining airlines. It's no, 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 no. I did not say that. <laughs> we, I said... We might. It doesn't let's, have to come to that. Let's read back to the transcript. That was the approach that the United States followed uh, a decade ago. Back a decade ago. But it does have to come to that in the modern era. And hopefully it won't come to that. But what if it did come to that, Dr. Hanning? What, what, uh, <laughs> what, what, we, we, I, we have sometimes conflict with the U.S. Yeah, like I've heard that. I've heard that. Apparently, Angela Merkel doesn't like her cell phone being uh, monitored. And even the conflict with the U.S. could be compromised, I would say. But in fact, I think uh, we could find a solution. And of course, it would not be only Germany, it would be the whole European uh, companies, and I think it would not make any sense that the uh, U.S. would block the European airline, we would block the American airlines. I think it would not be a good blame game. Uh, therefore, I'm very confident that we will find a solution. And again, I think uh, we are learning our lessons in uh, Europe as well. I have mentioned the terrorist attacks, uh, you have mentioned PNR in uh, Europe, and I think we are on the same way, and uh, the way is paved for a good compromise or for a good solution. I'm very optimistic. <laughs> there we go, and, and, and I assume that Virgin is going to continue to fly to the U.S. I think so, yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Henning's right, uh, absolutely, that uh, the, the terrorist threat in Europe has changed the mood, um, including in the Commission, and I think you know, they, will, they will find a sensible compromise. Um, it's PNR is not the only data that matters, but it is it is really important, and I think everybody now recognises that. And within Europe, Europe, we need to share it better. Never mind between Europe and the US. So can, can I just say? Can I, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no. Well, it's good. I'd, I'd, I'd rather hear from Judge Mukasey. I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear from point. both of you. So, Judge, you know, you hear from Director Hannigan that that the the terrorist threat, and I think you heard this from Dr. Hannigan too. The terrorist threat has changed the feeling in Europe. Yes. Why has it changed the feeling in the United States? Is it because we haven't had those attacks, so that quantity, or has it changed and we just don't know it yet? <coughs> no, no. I think we have suffered more attacks in Berlin, for example, yeah. the Americans and others, and uh, the German public opinion that the people, they fear, now we have, are more threatened than before. We have a growing threat of uh, terrorists, and of course we see this migrant crisis, refugees. You see uh, 
uh, I have mentioned, more than one million people have entered the country. Many of them coming from regions which are, let me say, uh, problematic. Uh, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, Afghanistan, uh, Middle East. All these uh, regions uh, are producing conflicts and some of the conflicts are carried out in Europe, are carried out in Germany. Therefore now, I think there's a new consciousness uh, in Germany and I think all over Europe. Uh, not only in Germany, we have seen the terrorist attacks in Barcelona, in Spain, we have seen it in London. Again, I think that has created a new feeling of being threatened and that enables us, enables uh, security forces to get a better legislation, a better legal framework. Yeah. I, think, I think one thing that has cut against um, intelligence efforts, and it's really regrettable, um, is a kind of, is a suspicion of government generally in the United States. I mean, that's, that may account for part of the lack of anxiety here, or the lack of expressed anxiety um, about, um, about uh, terrorist, terrorist attacks, uh, when you combine that with the spectacular distortions um, of what Edward Snowden, in fact, knew and did, um, uh, it bears the, the, the distortion of information. Um, it, it, account, it accounts, I think, for a certain level of, of resistance and a certain level of paranoia um, among, among, among Americans that is without factual basis. Um, and, that, and that interferes with, the, with our ability to get this legislation through. Well, so Ambassador Sill, I know you're about to leave, but I will, I will, I will throw one bomb at you uh, as you're walking out the door. Um, Judge McKenzie talks about a sort of a, a, a deep-seated fear in America of government, and this is something that's come from our, our, our constitutional founding. Right? Our framers were very worried about uh, an overweening executive. Uh, but you see that, that fear, whether it's paranoia or legitimate, uh, of government, surveillance and the like, whether it's PNR or the like, coming now from both the right and the left of the United States, and even, I think even within the current administration, there's, there's some tension about surveillance, when, how, where. Uh, how do we resolve that as a nation as we're going forward, and how do we think about that in terms of cooperating with our allies, and how do you think about that when you talk to our allies in Europe? Well, as, as an Article Two official, um, let me just point out that it was the legislature that the framers regarded as the most dangerous branch. Correct. Um, so let me pass the buck to uh, our, our, our friends on the Hill on that one. Um, I, I think you're exactly right that sort of built into American um, political culture is a deep-seated ambivalence about the potential for governmental overreach of whatever branch, including judicial overreach, potentially, uh, in the national security space, depending on the setting. Um, and I think that's why you have reflected in U.S. law um, and policy structural constraints on surveillance that are actually far more constraining than what you see in other countries around the world. Um, the gap between reality and perception when it comes to the permissiveness of U.S. surveillance um, is, is really quite remarkable. Um, as, as Judge Mukasey has pointed out, we have the Madisonian trifecta. That's unusual globally. Um, in many cases, state security services are allowed to conduct surveillance without any judicial supervision whatsoever. Simply turn on a switch at the say of often a minister. Right? That's not nothing, right? Getting a minister to say something, um, yes, minister, right, is, uh, is sometimes a challenge, but you know, a neutral and detached magistrate, it isn't. Um, it's also the case that in other countries, it's permissible to engage in national security related surveillance to collect information about a whole range of different issues. Not just threats to the national security, not just uh, risks of nuclear proliferation, but things like ec the economic well-being of the nation. U.S. law is far more circumscribed. You may only collect foreign intelligence information that is foreign intelligence information under 702 and other authorities. Um, and the level of transparency um, and oversight in the United States is often far more, massively more, I would even say, uh, uh, ambitious than what you see in foreign countries. Uh, the United States went through the Frank Church era. Uh, other countries haven't. They haven't had a reckoning with um, their intelligence services possible overreaching. Um, we have, and we've corrected for it. Um, so yeah, I, I recall a couple of years ago, um, a, a country, a very close ally and friend of the United States was having a national conversation about a new surveillance law. And um, a number of commentators said, this law is outrageous. This is, the, this is the fill in the blank Patriot Act. And the answer was, it's not the Patriot Act. It's far worse than the Patriot Act. <laughs> not worse, 
It's far more permissive than the Patriot Act. Better. Better, well. <laughs> anyway. Well, so that's, that's really helpful. So, um, and it, I know that you're about to leave, so any last you, words you before you leave us you for, keep your, for our allies? It's almost as if well, you're I'm trying, trying to, to, I'm not trying to. <laughs> I'm not trying to give you an easy out. We got three minutes. Um, any any last words for us? I, I know you sort of you've given us your, your thoughts on this one particular issue. But anything, anything you want to say before you have to jet out? Uh, onward. Onward and upward. Onward, yes. Um, so uh, so we have these these tensions that continue um, between uh, on one hand, as as uh, Ambassador Sales said, you know, uh, this ambivalence the United States has about government activity. Um, and at the same time, um, the need to protect the nation. Um, it seems that the UK has those same tensions in a way that's different than Europe, than the rest of Europe. The rest of Europe, it, it feels like, at least, and, and maybe Dr. Hanning, you can tell us, um, uh, but, but you know, whether, whether it, it, our perception, at least in the United States, is Americans are more afraid of their government and more comfortable with corporations having information. And in Europe, it's even split. They're comfortable with the government protecting them and having the information they need but are much more concerned about corporations and, and industry. Um, so, but, but it seems like the UK should be more like us, but what, 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 is, it like in, what is it like in, 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 in England? Well, of course, it could all be our fault because I think you know, <laughs> your suspicion of government may come from it, your experience of that. Which, which, general warrants. <laughs> which by definition we haven't had, so. <laughs> And in, uh, of course, in, in Europe, you have very different experiences. And as I think Dr. Hanning was, was to get the history in Germany is very different. So uh, particularly in East Germany, you know, there is a, a fundamental, you know, a simple, a different approach to privacy. Ours is probably, uh, you're right, that if you look at the opinion polls, people trust um, government much more in the UK than they trust big companies. So Google, for example. That's, but it's the, other, it's the other way around here, as I understand it, certainly in the polling. Here actually. we give Google everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it would so do we. But, um, <laughs> In terms of trust, I think uh, your government is, 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 and institutions are broadly trusted. The oversight is pretty good, it's improving. Um, so I think it's, it's slightly different from the European experience, um, but quite a long way from here. We don't have, you know, privacy is important, um, and it's a qualified right under European law, and under, therefore under British law. Uh, we don't have quite the same uh, extreme attachment to privacy that sometimes seems extreme to us. You know, I've, I've had debates with people from you know, some of the organizations here who are privacy advocates who genuinely believe that people dying in atrocities and, and terrorist attacks is a price worth paying for absolute privacy. They, they really believe that. Now, I know they're at the extreme end. I don't think you see that in the UK. You see uh, people who have strong views, but not, not, not to that degree. And it's, of course, not a constitutional issue in the UK. Well, so Dr. Hanning, given, given Germany's history, uh, particularly in East Germany, um, with overweening state surveillance, um, why, why today does Germany seem more comfortable, tell me if I'm, I may have the perception wrong, more comfortable with their own government surveillance, completely concerned about American surveillance, and deeply concerned about German corporations? <laughs> yeah. I think uh, the cooperation with the United States is close. We share the same values. I just want to uh, press this point. Uh, on the other side, uh, you have mentioned the close cooperation between BND and NSA was very close. And uh, from the German perception, it was to a certain extent misused because uh, um, NSA has targeted German companies and European companies. And uh, that was. Uh, 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 the allegation against BND that BND was helpful in uh, spying out uh, these companies from NSA. I think that was uh, one of the problems. But now I think this is solved, really, and it's not an ongoing problem in our uh, relationship. Coming back uh, to German history, coming back to the uh, east part of Germany, yes, of course, uh, we have uh, a special history in Germany, good or bad, uh, yes. Uh, uh, we are uh, discussing the Russian interference here uh, in the American uh, election campaign. And uh, I am always joking, that was one of the great successes of the uh, Russian uh, intelligence services. Our, in the short run, in the long run, I think it was a big mistake. Really? And I think so, yes. Why? Because it is, of course, strengthening the relationship between Russia and uh, the, uh, the United States. Mm -hmm. In the long run, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure from my point of view, it was a big mistake. Mm. 
Uh, but uh, we have uh, the same uh, experience in German history, you know, without uh, the German intelligence, uh, the uh, October Revolution in uh, Russia wouldn't have uh, take place. We have uh, allowed Lenin go to uh, Petersburg and we have finance in the beginning. Yeah. The, it was a great success yeah. of the, the <laughs> German uh, <laughs> intelligence in the short run. In the short run. Yeah. Therefore, I compare a little bit with the Russian interference. But uh, one, uh, another word, yes, of course, there is uh, a certain mistrust. We have uh, GDR experience. Uh, on the other side, we have a very strong other side. I just, I want to compete a little bit with our American friends on behalf of other side. We have a really strong other side. And uh, in the German history after the Second World War, we have never misused the intelligence services for political purposes. We have seen this in Italy and other European states. Uh, we haven't suffered this, such a problem in Germany due to our oversight. I think our German system is not so bad. We have a lot of legal barriers, there are a lot of problems. But uh, I think that we have changed the situation during the last two years now. We, uh, the German intelligence services have got more resources, more personnel that never did in the, pa in the past in the history, due, of course, to the situation, not only on behalf of terrorism. We see all the conflicts uh, in our borders. We see the Middle East problems. We see Russia. We see uh, all the problems in the Maghreb states and migration and so on. Uh, again, I think, yes, we have changed the attitude. Uh, German intelligence is more capable than before. And therefore, again, I, coming back to our discussions uh, uh, some minutes ago, I think we will have brought a, go a good consensus, a broad consensus with our American friends on behalf of terrorism. But again, for us, it's a very important issue, that's internet. Uh, really, I think we have to find new solutions, new ways to tackle these huge problem what we are facing in Germany. I think not only in Germany, you in the US as well. And I hope that we could find common solutions for more controlling these hate messages, these instructions for building explosives and so on. I think that's a big issue, a big problem for us. Yeah. So Judge, what about that? You know, there's been a lot of debate um, in the last few weeks and months about the responsibility of Google and Facebook and Twitter. This has largely come up in the context of the, the Russian uh, interference allegations. Uh, but putting sort of the Russian uh, piece to one side and talking just about terrorism, uh, you know, we know that the Boston bombers, the Boston Marathon bombers, uh, obtained the instructions for building those uh, pressure cooker bombs from Inspire magazine, a magazine uh, created by the now deceased Anur al um, written by Samir Khan, an American right, uh, the, living abroad. With the, with, the catchy, um, with the catchy title, how, how to build a bomb in the kitchen of your mom. Exactly. <laughs> and what do, we, what, what do we as a nation uh, either the legislature, uh, the executive branch, do about that? And what responsibility does private industry, the social media companies, uh, the companies that have, uh, have this stuff being distributed on their, on their web servers, like, what responsibility do they have, if any, moral or legal, um, in this area? Well, um, not being a cleric, um, I try not to pronounce on moral responsibility. Um, as far as legal responsibility, we have a First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and it protects against regulation of content, even regulation of that kind of content, unless you can make a showing of a clear and present danger, and generally you can't. Um, what about the bomb-making guide? The bomb-making guide is simply a curiosity, unless and until it falls into the hands of somebody who's inclined to use it. Um, and I can see you know, kids reading it for amusement, uh, and I can also see terrorists reading it for, to, to find out how to do it. I think what is necessary is um, a self-monitoring by um, the, the entities that put that stuff out as to who it is who's, who's tuning into that. Um, and um, perhaps um, a combination of, of that information um, or provision of that information to the government uh, so that they can correlate it with other intelligence that they've got. Not as a matter of law, though. Not as a matter of law. It's going to have to be voluntary. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the we, we've, got a, we've got a lot of obstacles to overcome in this country before um, industry can cooperate voluntarily with the government and not feel that it's going to suffer sanctions in the marketplace as a result. Well, and, and let me ask about that. You know, what, right, after, um, right after these Snowden um, uh, misconceptions um, uh, were put out in public, um, you had the CEO of Google, 
uh, referring to uh, NSA as the enemy um, and uh, saying things like we're at war with the U.S. government, uh, in part because uh, Google and other companies were concerned that the U.S. government was, was, uh, was coming after them in ways that they thought were unfair and inappropriate, um, albeit under the law, um, and, uh, and a perception that they were going to face economic challenges in Europe uh, as European companies uh, argued that they were more privacy protective. Um, how, how did that look from across the pond? How did it look uh, in Europe when those revelations came out and you saw this infighting between the U.S. government on one hand, the Silicon Valley on the other, um, and, and, and a very unusual situation, uh, I think probably unprecedented in American history. Yeah, well, I, <clears throat> I don't think we were just observing it. I mean, we experienced it too. So uh, the worst legacy in some ways of Snowden, I mean, there were lots of individual bits of damage he did, but the worst legacy was poisoning the relationship between the tech companies and governments. So we had had a very good working relationship with most of them, uh, as I said, the NSA and, uh, and other US uh, agencies. Uh, overnight, it became impossible for them to be seen to be talking to us, really. Uh, and that has taken a while to, to put right. It's much, much better now, and, and actually terrorism has, has lifted everybody out of that slightly sterile debate and made everybody focus on trying to solve the problem. And if anything, has put the pressure onto the tech companies um, as it was inevitably going to. Uh, but for a while, it was really difficult, I think, and uh, it was just impossible to talk to them. Uh, they do hold a lot of the uh, levers on counterterrorism and on content, especially, as, as the judge said. Um, you know, cooperative agreement with them is much more effective than legislation anyway. I mean, it's, it's difficult here for constitutional reasons to legislate. In Europe, it wouldn't be. Um, but even so, doing it in a cooperative way is just easier, quicker, and more comprehensive. And, uh, and so, you know, one of the things that I think uh, we might not have highlighted, and I wonder, I'd like to like, uh, take the panel's view on, is, you know, one of the reasons to do it in the way that both you and Judge McCase described, so it's cooperative rather than legislating it, is that technology moves quickly. Uh, rapid innovation is happening um, in this space. Uh, might it be even more challenging if we tried to regulate or, or even worse, legislate uh, these decisions? Um, in Germany, how do you all think about that? Do you, do you see cooperation as, as the best approach or is, or is legislation uh, necessary in this space? You mentioned that you got recently had social media legislation. Yeah, yes we have, but I think uh, in the first line cooperation is needed, but sometimes uh, you have, let me say, to urge a little bit for cooperation. And that uh, we try in Germany to a certain extent. We have made the legislation very new, but in the end of the day, you can't solve the problem on the national basis. You have to find solutions, international solutions inside the Western world. And of course, uh, the main providers for social networks are uh, posted here in the United States. And therefore, we had a discussion in Germany with the national representatives and uh, they seem being cooperative. But I think in the end of the day, we need uh, common solutions. And uh, I think we couldn't live uh, with the world in a situation that these internet platforms are used for preparing terrorist threats, for recruitment of young Muslims uh, all over the world. I think we have to do something. And that is the responsibility of the providers for, for social networks, for Google, Facebook, and so on. And they told us publicly that they are aware about this problem, that they want to take over responsibility. But of course, we have to wait and see. Hopefully, they are carrying out all their promises. Uh, yeah, and they've moved their position, too. I mean, I think I remember five years ago, it was very difficult to get the, the companies, even on something as, so, as obvious, where there's huge consensus as child abuse and uh, indecent images of children online. It was really hard to get the companies to face up to that, recognize it, and start to do something about it. Um, because it, it crossed this ideological line for them that they are just neutral, or were neutral conduits. They are not publishers. They don't, they're not responsible for content. Uh, they eventually conceded that they were responsible, and they've done great work, actually. Uh, and I think once they conceded that, they logically had to concede that they're also responsible to some extent for the terrorist content they carry online, and for everything else, for the fake news and the hate. They are, it, it, they're not quite publishers, but they're somewhere between neutral conduits and uh, for data and publishers. So it is changing, and I think they are changing their view, but it, it's, this is new territory. The, the whole infrastructure is new. So I think we'd love to turn to the audience for questions. Uh, so do we have any folks in the audience who'd like to ask questions of our, of our there are a couple of microphones here, I see up here at the front, um, and one at the back there. Um, so please feel free to come to the microphones. We'll take questions. Ma'am? 
Uh, hi, good afternoon, Michelle Roberts of BlackRock. Um, the case of the United States versus Microsoft concerns compliance with a probable cause warrant in respect of data stored abroad, and some commentators have observed that this case sets up the battle between um, U.S. disclosure and European privacy laws, and we've touched on European privacy a little, and wondering if the panelists have any thoughts on U.S. versus Microsoft. Thank you. So data localization, the fear that, um, that if data is required to be stored one place, it might be accessed uh, there by the government at the same time. Perhaps companies are considering putting data overseas in order to get, prevent their own governments from having access to it. How do you see that playing out, and what does that mean for, for cooperation on, on counterterrorism matters? Well, we've, we've been through similar cases, and of course there's the, the Ireland case um, where uh, micros, uh, um, uh, Facebook data is stored in Dublin. Um, uh, so this is, this is going to be a feature of the future, and I, I, I worry that we'll end up with a kind of balkanized in internet where lots of data is localized, and you see in a jurisdiction like Russia what happens when data gets localized. Uh, it's not a healthy development. And so I think if we can avoid that, um, w we certainly should. Uh, I don't think there is an easy solution. Um, uh, and I think there are fundamentally different approaches to privacy of data, I think, in, in Europe and the United States to the extent that in Europe there is a huge em emphasis on the personal data held by companies, uh, which I don't see to the same extent in the United States. There's a great emphasis on what government does with data, but less so what, what companies do. And trying to reconcile those two is going to be quite difficult. I think uh, we are all, uh, to a certain extent, the victim of the Snowden discussion. And therefore, I see that Microsoft and other companies, they uh, prepare storages uh, inside Europe, especially inside uh, Germany. And therefore, we can avoid all these problems uh, between the legislation in the US and, and, and Europe. I think that is the development I see. Does that, does that cause us concerns about the efficiency of, of the storage of data? Now they're localizing data. It's going to be more. It's going to be more expensive for the companies, and will expose them to access by the local governments. Is that a concern for? Microsoft is running the storage, and therefore I'm convinced that we will be very efficient. Right there, you go. <laughs> Judge, anything? Yeah, I was simply going to point out that um, as far as access by by a U.S. Uh, court to information that's stored abroad. Um, the issue ought to be, and I think is, uh, who has control over it. If it's controlled by people in the United States, then sticking it overseas um, isn't going to solve the problem and shouldn't. Well, so Judge, but you know, these companies say, look, we're global companies. We're, yes, we're headquartered in the United States, but we're global. We have to deal with all the laws, so you can't force us to violate European laws when we store the data in Europe in order to comply with American laws. What about that? The short answer is, yes, we can. Um, <laughs> and, Spoken um, like a two district court judge. No, no uh, look, I, I, ha I, ha I ran into this problem, actually a, a kind of mirror image of it, um, in a case where we were having, they were having trouble locating witnesses um, overseas in, a, in, a, in a, an art theft case, and um, they knew where they had last worked, but had no trace of them. I said, well, it's very easy. Go to their employer, find their home address, um, and, and locate them. So we can't do that in Europe. You what? Ask the, ask the company about their employment records. Can't do it. The question is really who is responsible. Microsoft is running, but not responsible. Yeah. And therefore, I think uh, uh, the company responsible for storage is not subject to the American legislation from our standpoint. Interesting. And I think it wouldn't be not a good idea for American companies to violate the European uh, law and the German law. That would be my advice. Yeah. Yeah. Sir. Uh, I oh, uh, back there. Thank you, sir. The mic. Back. There, there has been much mention of the censorship of hate messages being part of the solution. Yet much of that is, as Judge McCasey mentioned, in the United States would be protected speech. Dr. Hanning, in, in Germany, I know that the approach to the social media outlets um, has been very direct. Whereas in the United States, those same social media outlets are beginning on their own um, to decide to, to look for and filter these messages. As Judge McCasey mentioned, part of this um, conflict is, is cultural. And for the very people that want to begin to engage in this cultural debate, when there is an Islamist cohort that's intransigently resistant to assimilation and ready to complain about a message being perceived by them as hateful, 
when it may be a, a challenge as far as beginning this debate on, on how to define our culture. Um, how d do you, when it comes to censoring messages, it, this cuts both ways. And how is Germany um, proceeding when it comes to also protecting the right to have that defense of the culture? We have uh, a very new legislation and uh, we don't have enough experience how it really works or not. Uh, my personal view is that in the end of the day we need a cooper cooperative uh, solution. You can't solve it uh, by law in Germany or by law in France because uh, internet is an international transborder uh, situation and therefore uh, there are limited uh, possibilities for national legislation really to regulate uh, the internet. Uh, and again, my impression is that the providers, at least in Europe and, and in Germany, and we have not only a problem in Germany, I think uh, there are other attempts, uh, as I know, in Great Britain and UK and in France as well, that they think, yes, we are to a certain extent responsible and we are ready to cooperate in this very sensitive field. And therefore, again, my hope is that we find common solutions, cooperative, cooperative solutions with uh, providers of the internet. I mean, I would, I'd just add that I mean, we now know a great deal over the last well, 15 years uh, about what radicalizes people and what effect this information has on individuals, uh, either because we, we, we know about them from their de detention and from their trials or through uh, human agents where they're still active. So we, there's a body of data that shows the radicalizing effect of some of this material. And I think that has led to the conclusion in Europe that you know, some of it should be uh, censored, as you put it, I mean, certainly in, there is a cultural difference in the treatment of freedom of expression. I mean, most European countries have legislation that limits uh, the right of free speech to incite racial hatred, for example, or to incite violence. So you know, it is a qualified right again, and there are cultural differences between us on that. Uh, in the UK, as Dr. Hanning said, we hope that the companies will start to do this for themselves um, in cooperation with academia and civil society and government. Uh, if they don't, they're, they're certainly politicians at home have, have threatened some form of legislation. But it's not, as Dr. Hanning says, it's not easy to work out how the legislation will actually uh, have effect. Yes, hi, Paul Kaminar. I'm an occasional lecturer at the Naval Academy on national security law. And following up on this uh, internet issue, uh, the homegrown terrorist in New York a few weeks ago, uh, you know, rented the truck, killed eight people, yeah. et cetera. And the police found on his cell phone uh, uh, 90 uh, ISIS videos and 3,800 photographs. And no doubt, uh, a lot of that was downloaded uh, from sites that started overseas, from ISIS propaganda centers. They, of course, have no First Amendment right to spew their jihadist hatred into the United States. As I understand it, France and Great Britain does shut down those sites. I don't know what Germany does, but why doesn't the United States use that as at least one tool in their arsenal to at least block out the foreign ISIS propaganda where there's no uh, First Amendment problem at all with that. Judge, is there, is there a First Amendment concern in your mind about if the U.S. government were to block uh, foreign websites that, were, that, were, that had sort of this uh, hate, hateful propaganda or, or, or terrorist propaganda? There are some peripheral First Amendment concerns in that um, there are claims of rights to access to information and that right, of course, generates from here. Um, to, us, to the extent that the physical location of where this stuff originates from is overseas, it does afford a little bit more uh, flexibility, um, and we can, um, to a certain extent, take electronic steps to shut it down. On the other hand, um, our intelligence agencies do use those sites to monitor what's being said, and so every time you shut one of them down, um, you shut down also um, a potential source of intelligence information. So there's a, there's a balance to be struck so there's there. there's this tension between, between collection and, and, and action. Right. I think that, that, that's always been true. There's yeah. always a balance between intelligence let got, uh, gain or loss and um, taking something down. And, and we, we're used to that intelligence community in trying to balance those. I absolutely agree with the judge that uh, First Amendment rights do... Uh, 
there is some flexibility where stuff is hosted overseas, but as we found with Inspire, for example, and lots of other examples, including the ones you, you refer to, there's no such thing really as a foreign website anymore. I mean, they're foreign for a while, but very quickly they get replicated within the United States, and that becomes, I think, a First Amendment problem very quickly. It's just the nature of the internet. And of course, ISIL has been very, very good at that. They understand politics and they understand the law, and they've made sure that, peop that their media machine propagates stuff within the United States and uses servers here. In fact, one of the most one of the most destructive things I think about the Snowden revelations, that, as you point out, one of the, the many things, uh, but really was the fact that you know the the terrorists for a long time understood U.S. law and believed that U.S. law provided them additional protections, yeah. which it certainly did. It also provided us additional opportunities, as it turns out. Um, so, but it is they're very sophisticated, and I think we I think we assume. These are folks sitting in caves who have no sophistication. That, I think that is, uh, I think we, we undercount their sophistication at, to our peril. Uh, Ma'am at the back. Yes, hi, Carol Mathias from Southern California. Uh, a few days ago in the media, it was reported another huge breach at the NSA by a group calling itself the Shadow Brokers, uh, said to be bigger than the Snowden uh, breach. I'm just wondering if anybody on the panel would uh, comment or offer some insight on how these breaches can, can continue to occur, and uh, what are we doing about it? Thank you. Well, I, uh, <laughs> right, I mean, you, you know, GCHQ, uh, you know, it uh, could be Jim, next. Jamil, Once, uh, Jamil. Well, actually, I think this question is probably for you. Well, I, I'm trying <laughs> to put <punch> it away. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's, I'll, I'll, the, I'll take it out. I'll take it after. Sure. I mean, the particular case, uh, although it was in the New York Times the other day, is, is quite old now. Um, it is absolutely, and I, you know, I don't want to comment beyond what's been in the press because obviously I was in, involved at the time, but uh, the basic point is that if you have somebody either stealing or having stolen large caches of vulnerabilities or sophisticated cyber tools, um, that is a, a huge problem for everybody. Um, what can you do about it? Well, I think this is a back to basic security. How do you, how do you stop insiders or outsiders? Uh, gaining access to large amounts of, of uh, very sensitive data. And it's, it, it's, it's not a new problem, but it in some ways seems to be growing on the insider threat. Uh, on the actual cache you talk about, um, it's different from Snowden in the sense that I think Snowden hit the headlines because he was talking about what happens. Um, in many ways, shadow brokers and, and other compromises, for example, the CIA material, allegedly anyway, are more serious because they're, they're, they're actual tools, they're how you do it, they're code. They're not um, just sort of political stuff about how awful everybody is and how terrible the agencies are, which I think we can cope with. Releasing the code into the, into the wild is in a way much more damaging. And I, and I think the, the, real, the real concern, as, as I think Director Hannigan points out, is that uh, this code can be repurposed mm -hmm. and reutilized, and we've seen uh, in a few cases, want to cry to some extent, not patch it to some extent. Uh, they use some of these underlying tools, and that's a real concern because while the, while you're right, the, the the data and the capability and the tools are old. You know, if you if you accept that those were nation state tools, and again, I'm not I'm not going to you know concede that point. But if you've seen those were uh, nation state, whether American or otherwise tools, those were probably our highest end capabilities at the time. And so old though they may be, and we may have new capabilities, and we may not be have those taken back. The revelation of that code and the fact of the surveillance and, 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 the, and the capabilities we had, I think, can be very problematic. And, and if you worry about cyber threats today, right? I mean, the vast majority of cyber threats today take place through phishing access and the like. You know, why use your high-end capabilities when when simple and easy will work? Um, we have a lot of there's a lot of space here for bad people to act, and, and now it's in the wild, and that's that's a cause for tremendous tremendous concern. I think. Yeah, so far as monitoring the access of insiders to information, and you can discount this by the fact that it's coming from a liberal arts major, but I think that um, we've all had the experience of getting a telephone call from the bank um, asking uh, whether we're in Bimini, and uh, the answer is no, and uh, <laughs> your, you know, your credit card is running up charges in Bimini, and so they cut it off right away, and they, have, they, can, they can see abnormal patterns um, and jump on them right away, and yet, um, we don't seem to have the same capability, and I, I don't get it. Yeah, I mean, the continuous monitoring question of, of people in the Elms community has been a long, has been a long standing and challenging issue both in, 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 in the UK and, and I'm sure in, 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 in Germany also. So, look, at the end of the day, at some level, even the continuous monitoring uh, efforts are important and helpful, but at some level, you trust your people and you can't search everybody's 
bag and hard drive and they walk out the door every day. We, I mean, you know, the procedures we have in our intelligence agencies to prevent data from leaving are intense, but they're ultimately reliant upon humans, uh, who both of whom are, uh, can be conniving and can also just be careless. And, and sometimes, you know, personally challenging, we have, you know, we've, you've seen now the prosecution, the pending prosecution of an individual who took a tremendous amount of data home. Part of it looks like it, it wasn't sort of, he just, it was just something he did and it wasn't necessarily sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know evil in nature. And so it's hard. Sir. Um, very recently, there was a massive data breach at Equifax, uh, the credit reporting company in the U.S., and the report was that the data of half the U.S. population has now, been, has now fallen into the hands of unknown parties, whether it be uh, the Chinese government, the Russian government, or perhaps a criminal gang somewhere. We just don't know. Uh, there were other reports during the Obama administration of a hack, I, th I think it was of OMB, where OPM. the, OPM. thank you, where the uh, personnel files of a huge number of federal employees, including uh, those in FBI and other security agencies also, was uh, hacked and lost to unknown people, whether it be the Chinese, the Russians, or a criminal gang. These obviously are, you know, this is data about an enormous amount of the U.S. population, which raises sort of the obvious question of, although I'm extremely glad that the U.S. government is scrupulous about its handling of our data and, and all of these rules and, 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 and laws and things, when the, out in the real world, you know, a criminal gang or perhaps a foreign government already has probably my data, probably the data of most of the people in this room and of the U.S. population, haven't we kind of been outflanked? Hasn't the horse kind of left the barn? And don't we need to be thinking about a new paradigm in this area? Well, I, well, I think yes and no. I mean, if you take the Equifax example, which is a really good one, uh, if you look at the congressional hearings, it's a catalog of disasters. And there, there are two things that come out of it. One is they didn't do the basics. They didn't patch. If they had patched, this wouldn't have happened. Secondly, when they had the breach, they handled it in the worst possible way imaginable. I mean, they made every mistake in the book. They didn't tell people, they didn't tell the regulators, they tried to pretend it wasn't happening. And, and, and as the, uh, uh, one of the uh, congressmen said, you know, the, it, the corporate culture was the problem, it wasn't an IT problem. Uh, and that's typical of so many of these breaches. So getting the basics right and handling incidents when they do happen is something every company should be prepared to do. It's, it's kind of cyber basics, really. Um, Beyond that, uh, do we need a new paradigm? Well, if we get the defense right, get the basics right, I think there will come a point at which um, the United States in particular, but all countries will need to come to some kind of agreement uh, about what they do in cyberspace because uh, you know, clearly there are states, Russia, North Korea, Iran, that are behaving in cyberspace as they do in the real world, so aggressively and without regard to international law. Um, at, at some stage, that we are going to have to work out what we do in response. I think we're quite a long way, but a good start would be to get the defenses right. I, sh I should also point out that um, the stuff that was, was hacked into, uh, whether it was at Equifax or at, the, at OMB, um, was information that was voluntarily provided by the people whose information was taken. Um, this is not a hacking of US government intelligence collection by by these people, so that it seems to me the anxiety ought to be about the way the government may store and other people may store voluntarily provided information rather than saying we have to restrict the way the government gathers intelligence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dr. Hayes. Yes, I think uh, cyberspace is, uh, since 10 years, 15 years, a very new experience for all of us. On the one side, it enabled us uh, a lot of getting more productivity, it's very important. On the other side, it's very dangerous because everybody worldwide has access to cyberspace and uh, therefore we need more consciousness we are doing a lot uh, in Germany and I think in Europe as well and United States as well to need more we need more consciousness we need better protection and we have to spend more money for security uh, for cyber security I think in the end of the day uh, we have to do this sir in the front um, judge McCasey um, you mentioned that you think Americans are maybe too afraid of their too afraid of their government or overly cautious. Uh, do you think there's a chance that we are uh, uh, not afraid enough of European governments? Um, <laughs> Director Hannigan and, and Dr. Hanning both mentioned 
um, in connection with stopping, you know, in addition to actionable intelligence and child pornography, they mentioned hate speech and how to, how to make a bomb book in the same breath as all one category of, as kind of one category of information that needs to be addressed in the same way. And as we cooperate with the Europeans and build these tools, you know, presumably we'll use them in ways that are, are consistent with the First Amendment, um, and presumably the Europeans will not um, because they haven't so far and, and, and don't, have that, don't have that same protection. So even though the European governments are not constrained by the First Amendment, we're kind of contributing to violations of the First Amendment um, that could affect Americans and that could affect you know, the speech we value even if it's not in America. Um, to what extent should we be cautious about um, developing these joint tools that could then be used by governments who don't have our same protections? We already have instances of you know, uh, the, the Google takedown orders in, in certain European countries saying not only can you not show this search result in France, Google, you can't show it anywhere because of a French takedown order. I think this is a real threat, and I'm, I'm not so much afraid of the U.S. government. I'm afraid of the French, German, and British governments. Okay. Um, I hate to be flip, but I'm not. Um, the, um, the fact is that the First Amendment applies here, um, and it applies against the United States government. Um, it doesn't apply against European governments, and it certainly doesn't envelop uh, U.S. citizens or U.S. corporations wherever they go. That's just the facts of life. Um, and that the Europeans are cracking down on some of this or, or, or discussing cracking down on it um, seems to me to be quite natural in the normal course of things and doesn't, frankly, concern me at all. I don't think the major threat uh, that Europe faces is a crackdown on freedom of communications between and among um, Islamist extremists. I don't think that's a major threat. I mean, I, I completely agree with the judge. I don't, I don't think you're right in suggesting that you know, there are tools that are somehow being shared. These are different legal approaches to the same issues. So you're absolutely right. There's a different approach to freedom of expression um, between Europe and the United States. I don't see how that imposes on the United States uh, different, different standards. Um, it means that you may be able to search different things in different jurisdictions, which I don't think is great personally, but uh, that's the way it's going. But it's no different from, in principle, from you know, a European government saying we're going to sue a particular newspaper in Europe or ban a particular you know, t type of so hate speech, for example, the legislation on that, uh, and the United States choosing not to. I mean, different countries are sovereign and have different choices to make. I don't think there are common tools, though. What, what are you guys proposing? Wait, we got a gentleman back there. Uh, good afternoon. I would like to ask about uh, the topic of the panel mm -hmm. is very broad, counterterrorism, cooperation, and uh, surveillance. But like many panels, we end up talking mostly about FISA, SIGINT, and large bulk data, not talking about human intelligence, uh, mm -hmm. joint criminal activity, military action. So my question is, why is the focus when we go to these broad topics down to big data? Is that because of the Snowden re revelation is what's on people's minds? Or is it where we are in our society that really the effective counterterrorism surveillance is all big data, and that's what matters these days? So that's a, that's a great question. I mean, is, is, it, is, it, is it that we've sort of given up the human mission and, and, and sort of determined that really to deal with this global counterterrorism threat, you've got to have massive SIGINT, and, and because it's such a hot topic and it's, it's easier to regulate than, than human, we sort of ignore it. What's, what's, what's going on there? And is it different, do you think, in, in, in the UK than in the US or in Germany? I don't think it's that different, actually. I think the, uh, I, I don't know the answer. I think you're right that it's to do with Snowden and privacy, which everybody feels, it, it, albeit in different ways, everybody cares about it. Um, so I, I think that's probably it. And uh, it's getting used to a world in which there are just massive amounts of data readily available, mostly in the private sector, not in government at all, actually. Uh, there's far more available in the private sector. This is new to us in the last 25 years. We've never had this availability of data before. Humans is still really important, um, but uh, it doesn't have the same privacy intrusion issues that that big data does. So I, I guess that's the reason. Yeah. Although I think humans are still very important, of course. Uh, but uh, we don't uh, like to openly discuss all these issues of humans. But you need humans for certain purposes if you are doing intelligence, of course. On the other side, we see that uh, the new technologies uh, are more and more used uh, from our clients, saying from the intelligence uh, uh, perspective. And therefore, we have to deal with uh, uh, this new platform, this new internet, because uh, uh, internet provides us a lot of information which are very useful, 
And from the perspective of the intelligence, is internet uh, less dangerous than humans? It's very comfortable. Uh, very often, Mr. Hennigan knows better than me that you are not really aware being uh, uh, or being being a victim of uh, 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 of intelligence operations. It's a very comfortable tool for intelligence services, and therefore very often used. And uh, if you look to the practice, you can get a lot of information from the internet, from the so-called dark internet, and that is uh, less expensive, less dangerous than if you use human resources or human for getting the same information. Therefore, again, it's very comfortable from the perspective from intelligence organizations to use internet and to, to use signal intelligence. Well, um, yeah, um, General Hayden once compared the difference between um, human intelligence and signals intelligence by saying that signals intelligence was like looking at a thousand puzzle pieces, pieces of a puzzle that um, we don't know which of the pieces are actually part of the puzzle, which of the pieces are not, um, and that having a piece of human intelligence shows you the picture on the box, so you know what the puzzle is supposed to look like. Um, and yet, when the man who mowed down uh, and killed eight people and wounded a dozen others uh, was captured, his principal value uh, would have been as a source of intelligence. The first thing that was done was to give him Miranda rights and Miranda warnings rather than take him to a clean team um, and question him. Um, and I think, obviously, there have been, there's been debates about the way we gather human intelligence um, and uh, the way the CIA used to but no longer gathers human intelligence. And it may very well be that we ought to have more of that, i.e., human intelligence, um, and not diminish our gathering of signals intelligence, but rather use that to uh, enhance our ability to use it and figure out what's relevant and what isn't. I, I just, I agree absolutely. I think human maybe is underrated. All I'd say is it's got a whole lot harder in the, in the digital era. It's you know, the James Bond era of you taking a different identity every day and hiding easily just got very, very difficult you, you, because digital makes it very hard to be someone you're not. And the enemy is getting better. The, you're yeah, seeing yeah, an absolutely. increase in professionalization among these terrorist groups in terms of they're looking more and more like professionalized intelligence services. The, the, uh, the double agent uh, mm -hmm. activity in Coast where, the, where those CIA officers were killed, it's a very sophisticated intelligence operation by a terrorist group. And so, you know, we, it's, it's an increasing problem for us too. Sir, in the front. Uh, yes, my name is Nick Lesis. Uh, following the last question, I feel a little bit cowed, but I wanted to make a comment, and uh, it's more on the economic front. And that is that the data privacy rules and the disparity among them between countries and also data localization requirements also impose huge economic costs. Uh, it impedes commercial transactions. I've been working with USAID, USAID, the Agency for International Development, for about 20 years, and you know I'm aware that it also uh, you know impedes access, you know equal access to uh, services, uh, you know among different providers, and it has developmental impacts. Uh, we've been working on these kinds of things in Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum uh, and elsewhere. Yeah, thank you, uh, sir. At the back. Hi, uh, Chris Hollinger from the. Uh, uh, Chris Hollinger from the Hampton Roads chapter. Uh, question first for uh, Judge McCasey, but then for the other panel members to, to follow. Um, acknowledging all the First Amendment concerns with censorship and content, uh, co content monitoring of speech, could you describe maybe a factual situation where you think uh, the concerns would rise to a level where it would warrant that, that clear and present danger label? What, what takes something from just you know the bomb making guide that's out there for anybody to wow, we see this as a, enough of a threat that we need to do something about it um, to prevent something like the Boston Marathon bombing from happening. And, and to the, uh, after the judge is done, I'm wondering if our European uh, friends have a different perspective on it, a different standard in their countries. The trouble is it's hard to envision a situation where, um, I mean, the, the one thing I can envision is a situation where speech can be used as evidence in a criminal trial. Um, that's, that's not a problem. Um, I suppose that if you could show that um, information was being circulated to a restricted audience, um, i.e. members of a terrorist organization specifically for um, use, um, there would be a way to limit that or monitor it or, or divert it or, or distort it um, in aid of, in aid of, in aid of solving, in aid of solving or preventing a crime. We do that all the time. Uh, the FBI does that all the time in, in, in routine investigations. Um, but when you're talking about stuff that people proclaim in the open uh, in an attempt to influence other people, it's very, very dicey. 
Um, thank you all for a, a fascinating discussion. I just want to circle back to something that was briefly discussed, uh, the encryption and accessibility debate. Uh, you know, I don't think there's a specific question there, but I'd love to hear kind of the cross thoughts on the topic. Thank you very much. Well, so, you know, Director Hagan, you, you mentioned it uh, first, um, but, you know, there's this, there's this debate in, in the United States and in Europe about um, strong encryption and the need to protect uh, personal privacy and financial transactions alike, and they need to spread strong encryption. You've talked about that here in the United States even. Um, at the same time, you have Apple, uh, you know, putting strong encryption on their iPhones and throwing the keys away so that even if the government wants to come to Apple and get the access, get access to the data, the answer is no, we don't have a key. Too bad, so sad for you. Um, some have argued uh, that, um, that that actually is harmful to privacy because it encourages the government to go outside the law and, and obtain access like you did that iPhone by finding exploits then not revealing them uh, to, to industry and then therefore making people less safe and taking action outside the law. What's your, what's your sort of take on encryption, strong encryption, how it's utilized, the need potential for lawful access um, how does that play out both, both uh, here in the United States and in the UK, in your mind? I, I think um, I may be not where the, sort of the, where the UK political system is. I mean, I'm probably closer to the, to the, to the US as on freedom of expression, actually. But I, uh, on encryption, it is really difficult. I think um, there is no magic solution. You can't legislate your way out of this. Encryption is a good thing. We've, certainly my organization, spent 100 years improving it. Uh, it's critical to the economy, to people's privacy, to, to government safety, to everything, you, everything you, you care about, really, and to the defense of democracy, too, actually. So um, encryption is good. The, the challenge is how do you stop it being abused by uh, bad people who want to use it for the wrong reasons and to hide for the wrong reasons? Uh, that, that, that is really difficult. Um, where it's different in the Europe and, and, the, and the US is that there are two, obviously two types of encryption. There is the encryption that the people have a key to, um, in that case, uh, if you're in the US and a warrant is served against uh, a provider, then obviously they provide the data in clear and problem solved. It's, it's difficult in Europe because we can't do that. We can't serve those warrants on US companies. Um, so it's, it's, it feels worse, particularly for law enforcement in, in the UK. But where we are both in the same boat, if you like, is on end-to-end -end encryption. So WhatsApp, for example, um, Apple when it comes to devices. Uh, and that is a mathematical problem. It's, it's been invented, and you can't uninvent it, and no amount of legislation is going to uninvent it. And there are a lot of politicians in Europe saying, oh, we must ban it. Um, yeah, short of taking people's iPhones off them at the airport um, or <laughs> trying to get them to delete WhatsApp. I mean, it's just politically and, and ethically unthinkable. So you can't uninvent this. The best thing you can do to get around the abuse of encryption by individuals is well, two things. One is to work with the companies cooperatively on, on some, some ways around that encryption. And there are some technical ways in some particular cases. It's never going to be scalable, but you know, in the worst terrorist cases, for example. The other, of course, is hacking. If you can hack into somebody's phone legally and see what they see, no amount of encryption between it and the other end is going to be of any value. Endpoint hacking. Exactly, exactly. So most intelligence agencies uh, in the Western world are investing much more in that because that is the obvious way to, to get around encryption in those cases where you are legally entitled to do so, and, and they, they're going to be a limited number. But none of that really helps law enforcement, and, and I think uh, you know, for, the, for the local sheriff, or in our case, the sort of local uh, police officer, who in the past relied on this kind of data for basic crimes, you know, murders and abductions, and uh, those kinds of, of, of non-terrorist crimes, uh, the world has changed, and I, I don't see any easy way back at all. So, Dr. Henning, you know, in the U.S., there is some debate um, uh, about whether we ought require companies that operate in the United States to keep a key um, and, and give access to that key. Uh, there are strong arguments against that. It creates, uh, it creates vulnerabilities uh, that might be exploited. Um, how, do you th how do you all think about that in Germany? Of course, we have, we have followed this debate, but we have not such a debate in Germany. I think it would be impossible in Germany to force uh, companies to uh, provide the key to uh, law enforcement agencies. Not, not uh, possible in Germany. We try to find other techniques and other ways to solve the problem, but uh, we don't have this kind of discussion in, in Germany. So it would, it would not be possible. And, um, access, yeah. Judge, any thoughts? Well, I mean, I don't think that genie is going back in the bottle, um, number one. And um, number two, if we try to restrict um, encryption in the United States, number one, the only people who will really have 
access to encryption of people who mean us harm. Um, and secondly, we will create a, a competitive disadvantage for U.S. companies functioning abroad. Um, I think the way is to try to foster cooperation and for um, law enforcement agencies to go out and hire people um, to, uh, to, to bust into it, which is what happened in uh, uh, the case where we're, uh, sure. they wouldn't you know, they wouldn't turn over. Somebody, you know, they yeah. wouldn't turn over the key, and and uh, somebody went out and hired a, uh, as I understand it, an Israeli company that they managed to figure it out, and, and uh, then didn't tell anybody what the secret was. Ma'am in the front. Uh, yes, Joanne Young. Uh, speaking of terrorism and um, you know addressing uh, the breeding grounds for it, other than the internet, um, what? is being done both in Europe and the United States with respect to the ma 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 madrasas and the mosques where um, some of the more violent forms of is Islam are being taught, Wahhab Wahhab Wahhabism and so, anyway, so, so I can't. Salafism. Salafism. Yeah. I mean, this um, is, yeah. Yes, Salafism, where at least where I understand young minds can be, can be, um, you know, programmed for jihad, violent jihad. Yeah. Well, so I mean, the, obviously, you know, right here, just down the street in Falls Church, uh, Anwar Alaki used to preach. Um, I mean, they've got the example of the Finbury Park Mosque in uh, in 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 the UK. Forget Germany. Forget, forget Falls Church. He he was invited to Congress. Yeah, and then and then of course went overseas. Uh, you know, Germany has these challenges. What? How do how do you all think about? Uh, you know, obviously the U.S. we have a strong protection of religious liberty, and we and we balance that just like we do with our First Amendment challenges. How do you all think about uh, the radicalization that takes place in mosques, uh, whether it's online or, or in in those preaching? And, and, and what if, what do you do about it? If I could just add, it was my understanding after 9/11 in this country there was some surveillance within mosques here which may have stopped during the Obama years. And well, and, 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 right. and, and a fair question is whether, whether we think as, 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 as a society we want to make those trade-offs given our, our also you know, interest in religious liberty, right? Those, those are the challenges. How, how, do, how do you all think about that in the UK? Well, in our case, a huge amount of work went on in this after 9-11 and then after our 7-7 uh, uh, tube bombings in London, and an enormous amount of effort and money was spent. Um, the, the, and there, was hu there were huge problems in mosques and madrasas and just about everything you've mentioned happened, including intelligence work, but also uh, outreach by all the relevant agencies and the education department, and everybody got involved. The problem is that that threat has moved, really, out of mosques and madrasas now. So if you look at the last five years, um, particularly ISIL, uh, there isn't that, the radicalization isn't going on in the mosques anymore, um, or even in madrasas, it's going on in, uh, informal places going on online, it's going on in gyms, it's, it's shifted um, because of the pressure, I guess. Uh, so, and some of it is not as organized anyway with the, the self-starters being radicalized individuals or one or two or three people. Um, you don't need a, a mosque and they're unlikely to go to a mosque, frankly. Uh, so the threat has changed, but uh, it's a very, I mean, a very fair question and we, I think we have done a lot on those traditional areas but uh, the threat has moved out of them, really. Dr. Hamlin, do you see it the same way in Germany? No, I think uh, to a certain extent it's a cyber state, a kind of a worldwide digital mosque, to a certain mm. extent, from our point of view. We have, of course, uh, some problems with mosques. I remember a discussion with my then colleague from Morocco, the head of intelligence, and he asked me, what are you doing on behalf of controlling these preachers in the mosque? And I told him, oh, in Germany, it's impossible. We have our constitution. Uh, religion has a special status in our constitution. Uh, not possible. And he couldn't understand it. I said, we are controlling, of course, all our mosques, all our preachers, and so on. And in other states as well. Uh, we have uh, some problems in Berlin. Yeah, there are some mosques in other places as well. Uh, yes, our uh, domestic intelligence service um, visits its mosques. Yes, and we try to control it to a certain extent, especially if they are getting uh, preachers from outside. Uh, we have a special problem, not on behalf of terrorism, uh, with our Turkish DTIP. We have DTIP in Germany, and DTIP is financed by the Turkish government, and they are controlling DTIP. 
sometimes for purposes not in line with our legal framework. Therefore, we have uh, some problems. But again, uh, for us, mosque preaches in mosque is not the main problem. It's a problem, but not the main problem. Again, for us, internet is more important than the preachers in mosque. Yeah. And Judge, you know, this this is right at the heart of the tension in the United States. It's this this concern about religious liberty on one hand, the First Amendment, and uh, and the, the need to protect the nation. How, how do you see that? And uh, it looks like that's the last question. So you will have the last word of our of our panel today. God, that's that's uh, that's daunting. Um, I think a lot of the solution to this um, lies within the Muslim community in Western countries, and a lot of that solution, in turn, lies in the way Western governments approach those communities. Um, there is a man in the United States named Dr. Zudi Jasser. Um, he, in addition to being a physician, is a former lieutenant commander in the United States Navy, um, and has devoted himself to an organization called the American Islamic Forum for Democracy to promoting a non-radicalized, non-violent form of Islam. Um, that said, um, there is support in, within, the, within scripture uh, for the other view. And then the question becomes, well, to whom um, does our government conduct outreach? Our government generally conducts outreach to the people who grab the microphone and want to be heard um, against any surveillance, um, against any uh, attempt to call um, Islamic radicalism, Islamic radicalism. Those are people at organizations like CARE, ISNA, and so on. Um, now, if you're a member of a minority group and you see that the outreach of your government is not to people who are preaching moderation, but rather to people who are defending violence, then what do you think your reaction is going to be? And how receptive are you going to be to a nonviolent approach? Not very. Um, the short answer is we have to be more, I think, forthcoming and supportive of those organizations and, frankly, um, more restrictive of other organizations. Uh, of course, the counter argument is there's, a, there's an establishment clause in the First Amendment, and we're not supposed to be picking winners and losers in theological debates. Okay, I get that. Uh, but when the theological debate uh, concerns um, whether there is a doctrine that is going to be preached that is going to ultimately destroy this country, um, as it did, for example, when we opposed communist ideas, uh, we felt that we could take the offensive um, and, and, you know, and, and let the chips fall where they may. Um, I have yet to see any litigation over anything like that. I, I assume we will see litigation over it. But I'd rather have litigation um, that we might win um, than um, a constant outreach to people who are justifying uh, extremism, which assures that we're going to lose. With that, I'd like you to thank the audience. For the